talks is that uh, I, I sort of uh, fused two sets of slides, of talks, uh, and then uh, I thought ah, I also have to, of course, make a little list of what is contained in these talks. And then I sort of passed through the, the, the slides and thought, okay, well, let me just mention what's uh, included. And I realized that... Uh, oh, of course I cannot go back on the screen. I can't go forward either. Yeah. I can. So then I realized the list had become this, actually. <laughs> but uh, So let me just uh, quickly go through it. So what I will do is uh, just very quickly some basics on Hamiltonian formulation of mechanics and quantization. Then I'll talk about basics of geometric quantization. So we'll be doing lots of differential geometry here now. Then I will formulate the big open problem in geometric quantization. Uh, I'll then uh, recall you know, the Hitchin, uh, well, I'll, I'll then describe the Hitchin connection formulation of the big open problem. Then uh, I will talk about Hitch's on regional construction for rigid families, and I'll tell you what rigid families of Kähler structures are. Then I will do the first application to moduli spaces, so we will have to wait until here to see moduli spaces. But since we have seen them both yesterday and, and so on, it's okay, we, we know they're there. We're waiting for them. Then uh, I will talk about the, the first generalization of Hitch's connection to a slightly more general setting than he constructed it in. I will then do a second application to quantization of moduli spaces. I will then relate it to conformal field theory. And then finally, I'll talk about asymptotic faithfulness, the asymptotic faithfulness theorem. And then in the end of the talk, I will talk about the solution to the big open problem in the case of Kähler, general Kähler manifolds. So in particular, I'll tell you how to quantize observables for general curved phase spaces, meaning general Kähler symplectic manifolds. And then I'll talk about the Hitchin connection in that setting, and I'll talk about the Hilbert space structure in that setting too, and how the three of them play nicely together, which is something that is hard to come by normally. Okay, so then I thought, okay, let me uh, put some references, and then I thought, uh, I started doing this, and I thought, no, 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 I can't do all of the references, so I, and I said, I cut it down to my, the references that, that are, I mentioned of my own work, but that turned out to be uh, two pages of references, I'm afraid. So I'll try to uh, somehow cover aspects of all of these papers now for you. Don't worry, it sounds like a lot. <laughs> but uh, what I want to actually point to you here is that if you go and read this little paper here, it's not very long. And what it will do it is that it will actually tie my lectures very closely to Anton's lectures in the case of U1. So Anton didn't really cover U1, but uh, you can imagine what U1 might look like, and then it actually connects the two pictures very nicely. And we don't know yet how to really nicely connect the two pictures for SU2 or SUN, but that one does it for U1, and I think it would be a very nice project to understand how is what I'm talking about precisely related to what Anton yeah, I just forgot to mention, so if the slides are written too small or it's going too fast, you should have received by now a copy of the slides in your email. <coughs> so you can uh, have a look and also there's, you know, I realized that all of the notation I've been working with for 25 years more or less, so I know it inside out somehow and uh, maybe I was consistent, I hope so, across papers. But, uh, but you can find it, uh, so, so, so if you're not used to the notation, which you are not probably, you can find it uh, in you know, these open slides and then try to look at it. Okay, but let's get started. So the Hamiltonian formalism of classical mechanics, well, in that case, we start with a configuration space. So that would just be a Euclidean space with some dimension. For example, it could be R to the 3M if you have three if you have m particles that move in three-dimensional three space. Uh, of course, we then have, uh, say, coordinates on this space. It's q1 up to qn, a completely natural coordinate since we're looking at Euclidean space. And then the phase space is just the cotangent bundle to x. <coughs> of course, that is just rn, cross rn in this case here. And I have coordinates q1 up to qn on x already, and then I just supplement them with p1 up to pn, which are coordinates for the momenta. 
And they are just, you know, the usual coordinates on the cotangent bundle. Okay, and now a Hamiltonian in this case here is simply a smooth function on the cotangent bundle. So a good example from classical mechanics is the standard one. You have the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. Here's the kinetic term. And then the potential is some kind of potential on the configuration space of the points. And then the equations of motions are simply just given by these equations you see right here. So the time evolution of the system is given like this. Okay, so now of course we can give this, so I'm, I, I'm sure all of you know this, but I just want to start a place where we can all be happy and agree and so on. So uh, let's now take and, and do a symplectic formulation of this. So on the cotangent bundle of Rn, I have of course the completely standard symplectic two form on R2n. And for any function on R2n, I can construct its Hamiltonian vector field. It's a vector field on, uh, on X. And uh, I think actually I made a mistake here. So what I meant to say here is actually this is a vector field on the cotangent bundle of X. And it is just defined via this equation here. And so when you write things out in coordinates, it looks like, of course, this. Totally standard. And then if you look at a curve which integrates this vector field, so you take a curve gamma, integrate the vector field, then that gives you exactly the equations of the motion again. And now, how about how do you evolve observables? So observables are, of course, functions on the cotangent bundle. And in order to evolve uh, uh, observables, you just have to introduce the standard Poisson bracket that you have on any symplectic manifold. <coughs> So it's the Poisson bracket given f and g is just you take the two Hamiltonian vector fields of f and g, you stick it into omega, and that's the standard Poisson bracket. And now, very nice thing that you can prove is that if you have some observable that depends on time and you want to know how does it evolve via this mechanical system, well then it's just solving this equation down here. Okay, so that's very nice. Solutions of evolution of the system, solution of evolution of the observables. That's really nice. That's classical mechanics, right? Okay, um, of course, this can very quickly be done a little bit more generally. Let's take uh, now the configuration space to be a general manifold, because that would typically be this example. If you have a mechanical system, it may not be allowed to move in a Euclidean space. It might be constrained to be on some manifold X, uh, so one of the things is that if you have things that sort of evolve via, via, via sort of fixed distances between the various particles according to some graph, then that will form a manifold. In fact, I think any manifold can be obtained this way. Uh, so now what we do in this case? Well, in this case, we just look at the cotangent bundle to X, just as we did before. That has a canonical symplectic form. In fact, it has a primitive to that. So it has a canonical one form alpha, and uh, this one form alpha is just constructed very explicitly by considering the tangent space to the cotangent space and looking at the projection that it naturally has to the tangent space. And then if you are some point at the cotangent space, the form is explicitly given to you by minus p composed with this projection because p is an element of the cotangent bundle. And so when you project, you get a tangent vector, you can evaluate the cotangent vector on. So that's a canonical one form that there always is on the cotangent bundle. In local coordinates, so if you take local coordinates on x, q1 up to qn, you will get local coordinates on t star, which is just q1 up to pn. Of course, the p1 up to pn is just the dual basis of the vector fields corresponding to the coordinate functions, and then alpha is just given by this very simple expression here in local coordinates. <coughs> and of course, if I take d of this, I get the symplectic form. And so, the cotangent bundle has a very natural symplectic form. Okay. And so, here we are not curving momentum. Here we are only curving configuration space. But of course, we can also curve momentum. And the moment you curve momenta, you get exactly the realm of a general symplectic manifold, or as the physicist would say, a general curved phase space. <laughs> okay. All right. So very basic classical mechanics done in a sort of differential geometric way. 
Um, so, let's look at this general case. So let's remind ourselves that a symplectic manifold, or a curved phase space in the physics notation, that's a symplectic manifold. So what is it? It's a two-n-dimensional manifold <coughs> with a two-form, and the requirements are two things. It has to be closed, and then it has to be non-degenerate at every point. So that means if you wedge it together n times at every point, it has to be non-zero. So that's the non-degeneracy condition. And then, as I said before, of course you can define a Poisson bracket in a standard way. Poisson bracket under F and G is just omega evaluated on the two Hamiltonian vector fields. The formula I gave for the Hamiltonian vector fields work, of course, completely general. And so, uh, you know, if you have a given Hamiltonian, you can define the Hamiltonian flow with respect to this Hamiltonian, and it's simply just this, this, this solving this differential equation here for the flow. So that's a sequence of, in fact, symplectomorphisms. I'll get to that in a second. And so that's giving you the time evolution of the system in this case here. And the time evolution of observables is, is exactly the same. There's a mistake here. This should have been M. Okay. <laughs> Don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the C infinity function M. And what I was saying before was that the time evolution, so phi t, it's a sequence of diffeomorphisms, and uh, it actually preserves the symplectic form. And it's very easy to see that the Hamiltonian vector field you know, that will be followed from the fact that the leader derivative of the symplectic form with respect to the Hamiltonian vector field is zero. And so that's a little check with the Catan formula that that works. Okay. All right, so that's a sort of classical curved phase space dynamics would be described this abstract way. All right, so now, now we come to sort of the salient point. What is quantization? Okay, and that's a, that's a good question, okay? But if you look at sort of the way that Dirac liked to formulate it, what he said was that, or, and, and he, well, sorry, th this is not... The only direct, right? I mean, everybody who were doing quantum mechanics somehow realized after a while, you know, the space that you have to think about is a Hilbert space as opposed to this manifold, this, 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 this manifold, the symplectic manifold, okay? They weren't saying symplectic manifold and so on, but they realized that, you know, just our n should be placed by some kind of Hilbert space. Okay. And so this Hilbert space, you know, the unit vectors of this Hilbert space describes the state of the system, the quantum mechanical state of the system. And so therefore we replace points by these states in this description. And then observables now are really operators on this Hilbert space. And so if you want to have a quantization process, so you know we have from Newton and to quantum mechanics starts, there's about 350 years or something like this. We have lots of development of classical mechanics. So we'd like to be able to just carry that over, right? Because it's quantized. And that's why people have talked a lot about quantizing. In principle, you could also start the other way and say, let's throw all of that away, and then I'll now just start thinking about Hilbert spaces and operators and so on. But uh, it's a little hard to know exactly what to grab that models a given physical system, so that's why people have talked about quantization. Okay. So quantization means that you assign to a, an observable, which is a smooth function, an operator on this Hilbert space. And then a few guiding principles that you'd like to satisfy. It should be linear. You'd like the function 1 to quantize to the identity. And then you would like that the Poisson bracket goes over like this, where there's a new guy in, in town, which is Planck's constant. Okay, H5. Right. Okay, so there are many snacks to this and uh, many details and uh, things that are uh, not exactly as I just said it and so on. In particular, a few things I can mention is that, you know, these operators are typically unbounded operators, okay, but there are ways to deal with this in operator algebra. Uh, and so they only formally self-adjoint. You would like them to actually be self-adjoint operators if you're quantizing real functions. Okay, okay I'll get to that in a second. But so, the interesting thing about this is that such an operator, f hat, okay, it has a spectrum. So and the spectrum I'm interested in, is, in this case, is the eigenvalue spectrum. So the ones for which there exists a non-zero vector phi 
uh, 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 phi lambda in such a way that when you apply the operator to phi lambda, you get lambda times phi lambda. So, uh, yeah, so these are the important things, and you know, we'll, we get to measurement in a second. And the thing is, that if you measure this ob observable, you will ever only get one of its eigenvalues. I think nobody in the world can really explain why this is the case. But it is seen in every quantum system we know for the last 130 years. Okay. Now, what is time evolution in this setting here? Well, you just simply quantize your Hamiltonian to an H hat, and then you show, solve this Schrodinger type uh, evolution, I H bar phi prime is equal to H hat applied to, sorry, does it say psi t instead of phi, psi t. And, <coughs> and so that's the time evolution of the system. And if you want evolution of observables, well, it follows the same rule as you had before, except that now Poisson bracket has been turned into a commutator. So that's the time evolution of observables. Very neat setting, if we can realize it. Okay, well, it can be realized in many different cases. But so let me just sort of tell you what, what is the typical quantum experiment in the lab. So typical quantum experiment in the lab is that you prepare some kind of initial quantum state at the time uh, t start, okay? So there are various ways to do this. Turn on a laser, various thing, different things. Turn on a photon source, uh, you know, uh, tune ions with a laser so that they are swinging harmoniously together in some uh, vacuum chamber, many, many different ways. And then the time evolution of the system is simply obtained, as we just said before, by the Schrodinger equation, by, uh, which is a general formulation you see right here. And then, in the end of the experiment, well, if you want to observe something from the experiment, which is typically what we want to do with experiments, right? You have to measure. And if you measure some specific observable, then what you will get is that you will get one of the eigenvalues out, and which eigenvalue you get is totally random, and, however, the probability of finding the eigenvalue lambda is given by this probability you see right here. So the inner product between the final state and the eigenstate, and they're normalized, all of them, so it's exactly like this. Okay. And after you have measured the system, the system will be in state phi lambda. Weird, right? But that's the way it is. So this has been observed over and over and over again. And notice that they're all features are really important here. It's important that it is a Hilbert space, because the Hilbert space will tell you really what eigenvalues are there. Because I want those guys to be in the Hilbert space, the phi lambdas, right? So the Hilbert space structure is important to answer these questions. What are the possible outcomes of the measurement? And also, it's very important to compute the probability. Okay. Yeah. Is um, part of your axioms what type of functions are in the Hilbert space? So could it be L2 functions of all of M, or do you have... Uh, I'll get to that in a second, Murray. Right. Yes, yes. Uh, that's, you know. Yes, yes. Just a second. Just a second. Uh, so, uh, right there. <laughs> um, so, if, if we go back to the simplest example we considered before, that was a configuration space of Rn. In that case, M is just a cotangent bundle on Rn. And in that case, canonical quantization says you should take the Hilbert space of L2 functions on Rn, and not on R2n, but on Rn, so on half of the variables that are available, only of the configuration variables in this case. Okay? And then, how do you then quantize the functions? Okay. Well, it's not always possible to quantize all functions this way, but what you can do is you can, you can quantize the coordinate functions. And so the QIs correspond to multiplication by QI, clearly unbounded operators on L2. Second of all, the Is correspond to differentiation with a little minus i h bar in order to make it self adjoint So, and those satisfy those commutation relations. Um, 
So that's uh, really good. In fact, what you can see here is that there is a way to order things in such a way that you can always quantize functions which are the form polynomial in the momentum and then arbitrary coefficients of functions uh, you know, along the base of the configuration space. So functions of this type here, you simply just quantize them like this. That's one way of quantizing them. So there's an ordering issue. There was an ordering here. I chose a specific ordering right here. That's right. And so uh, if you do that to the Hamiltonian I started with before, well, there is the Schrodinger equation. You just quantize just like using this, right? That's the Schrodinger equation. Okay, good. Um, there is another way of doing it in the case of R2n. You can also just choose an isomorphism between R2n, the standard one, and then C to the n. And if you do that, what you can do is you can look at another Hilbert space, <coughs> excuse me, namely the Hilbert space of holomorphic functions, which is square integral with respect to a certain volume form. I'm not specifying exactly what the volume form is right now. Okay. But then the quantum operators now are simply just the QIs act by differentiation. Uh, I think actually it's a little funny. Okay, I chose this way. And the PIs act like this. Okay. And so you can get the commutation relations like this. And it turns out that there's something called the Bachmann transformation, which is a unitary transformation that tells you that the Hilbert space I had before and this Hilbert space are isomorphic, and in such a way that it intertwines the operators that I have here to the operators that I have before. So those two representations are equivalent. Okay. But so these two pictures, the canonical quantization I just gave you, namely this one here and this one here, is really omnipotent in the physics labs. Okay. They really use it. And one of the places where they really use it is photonics. So quantum photonics, they use it extensively. So here you have a laser, and this laser is admitting these bosonic modes. So it's really cute uh, quantum chromodynamics, right? That sort of describes this, well, sort of quantum electrodynamics. But that's simplified considerably, and you just have, for every laser mode that comes out, you have a copy of the real line, and just look at L2 of the real line. And then if you have many modes next to each other, you just take R, cross R as many times, and you take L2 of that. That's the space in which they work. And so right here you see squeezes. And these squeezes can actually do you know, certain specific Hamiltonians, namely some constant times qi hat squared plus some other constant times pi squared hat, the time evolution of that. So that squeezes the quadrature, they say. Okay, so it takes a perfectly coherent state and it sort of elongates its profile, squeezes it and say in the Q direction and elongates it in the P direction. And so in this case here there are two modes and two different squeezes. And then what happens is that the light continues to travel in these optical wires and it goes through beam splitters. And then eventually you have to do some measurements and the measurements over here are homodyne detections. Let me not tell you exactly what homodyne detections are, but they are the form that I just showed you before. So, in fact, this is a quantum computer. Uh, it uh, has this uh, sort of uh, setup here. It's uh, one that stands in Denmark, and we're working together with these guys to design it and to program it. It has 15,000 modes. So it's working in L2 of R to the 15,000. The reason why it can have so many is because you can pulse the laser, so you can time bin these things, so there are lots of pulses running on the wires at the same time. Okay, there was a little uh, surprise interlude. Now back to math. <laughs> so, okay, there's one simple case where we can continue this very simple process. Namely, if I take the cotangent bundle of a configuration space. If I take the cotangent bundle of X, then I have a very natural sort of way of looking at splitting between P's and Q's, right? Because I have just the functions on the base as the analog of the Hilbert space I had before. So I just define the Hilbert space in this case to be L2 functions on X with respect to some measure. And I've chosen a Riemannian metric on X, so it's a way that I have a measure. So that's the Hilbert space. And now the metric also gives me a Livy-Civita connection on the tangent bundle. 
And so what I can do is I can now actually quantize a certain subspace of the functions on this cotangent bundle, namely all the ones that are polynomial along the momenta again. And so what are they in abstract language? Well, they are just the direct sum of C infinity sections of symmetric powers of the tangent bundle, because they induce polynomial functions on the cotangent bundle. So I can quantize these functions here, and the formula is totally explicit and written right here. So if I have some tensor of length L, <coughs> I want to act on functions on the base. And so I'm going to do an inductive process. So I write this tensor as x1 tensor t prime, where t prime is the rest. And then it is simply just i h bar x1 acting on t prime hat, which has already been defined by recursion minus, in order to make it linear, you know, functional linear in x1, ih nabla x1 applied to t prime. So this is just the, oops, sorry. This is the Levi-Civita connection, thank you, applied, you know, the, the extension of the Levi-Civita connection to tensor powers of the tangent bundle applied to t prime, and then I take the head of that because now it's one smaller page. So this is an inductive process. And it starts, of course, by vector fields just acting on functions by differentiating the function with respect to the vector field. Okay. And so if I carry this process through with the following Hamiltonian, take the metric, which is quadratic. Everything is real here, right? Take the metric, which is purely quadratic in the momentum directions, and then take any potential function you like from the base and pull it back to the total space. It's very similar to what I had before in classical mechanics, right? Then this thing just quantizes to x hat is equal to i h bar squared, and then the Laplace operator plus v. So very nice, you know. This works really, really general, super, super nice. Great. But uh, what do I do in general? What will I do with a general symplectic manifold in order for this to work? Because you see that. <coughs> I'm constantly taking functions of roughly, or not roughly, of exactly half the variables in order to make this construction. And there are really good reasons why I do this, because, well, let me not jump ahead in my slides, so let me continue. So what will we do, how will we proceed for a, a general symplectic manifold? Well, there is a machinery called geometric quantization. It uh, partially works currently, I would say, but it's, it works beautifully in the beginning. So what do we do? Well, there is a little uh, obstruction to begin with, to do this program. Namely, uh, if you look at 1 over h bar times omega, take the class of it. Remember, it's a closed two-form. It gives a cohomology class. You want that cohomology class to lie in the image of the integer cohomology inside the reals. <coughs> if it does that, then there exists a line bundle, a complex line bundle, a Hermitian structure in the line bundle, and a connection that's compatible with the Hermitian structure, nabla, in such a way that the curvature of this is minus i divided by h bar times omega. Okay. And so I might sort of think, okay, let me try this. I, I, the pre-quantum Hilbert space, I'm just going to take all L2 sections of this line bundle. It's a Hermitian line bundle, so I know what inner products in the fibers are, and then I can integrate that inner product for two sections over the space, by taking the volume form associated to the, to the symplectic form. That's a Hilbert space. Check on that. OK, and now I want to define pre-quantum operators. And for some reason, which sort of has to do with solving the equation below, I do the following. I look at the operator, which is, on the first hand, just multiplication by f. So f can be multiplied onto a section. It's a new section. So that acts on the Hilbert space. Well unbounded operator, maybe. Okay, we can live with that. Then we take the Hamiltonian vector field of x, we stick it into the connection, multiply by minus i h bar, and that is what people call the pre-quantum operator. That guy is an unbounded operator acting on this Hilbert space, so that's all great. And, in fact, it satisfies Dirac's quantization condition on the nose and the two other ones also, because it's a linear assignment and the function <coughs> 1 would go to 1. <coughs> Perfect, you would say. However, there are two things that are really bad about this. A, e, 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 it does not 
reproduce canonical quantization. And that's where the discussion stops with the physicist. If you can't do that, they will ask you to leave the lab immediately. <laughs> so don't come with something that doesn't do that. And another thing they will be really upset about also is if it contradicts Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Those two are simply, don't tamper with that. Well, maybe you should, but anyway, no. That's, uh, <laughs> that's what they say. So therefore, I mean, it, it really doesn't really recover physics very well, this construction. And we all know somehow, I think, uh, what's wrong, right? Uh, that's kind of clear from what I've been saying so far. This is simply the wrong Hilbert space somehow in relation to these operators. Well, you could say all Hilbert spaces that are separable are isomorphic, so what's wrong with this guy? Well, we would like to tie this Hilbert space to the geometry in this case here, and so that's what's wrong. So what we need to do is to, so the geometric quantization answer to this is called a polarization. I warn you, that's not the same as the algebraic geometry's polarization. But, okay. So geometric quantization of polarization is simply a Lagrangian subbundle of the complexified tangent bundle. Okay, so it's a subbundle of the complexified tangent bundle, which at the same time is also Lagrangian with respect to the complex linear extended symplectic form. Okay, and now I'm going to introduce uh, at least the pre-Hilbert space. So vector space underlying the Hilbert space. And I want the sections of the line bundle in such a way that if I apply nabla to x bar where x is, x is any section of P, then I should get zero. So meaning that they are covariant constant along P bar. There's a very canonical conjugation when I tensor with C, right? Just conjugate on the C factor. And so, you know, if P is if P plus P bar is the whole tangent space, this is a complex structure actually, an almost complex structure, and I'm just looking at things that are holomorphic, that are annihilated by the deep bar operator. Okay. But in general, you know, or in other cases, you could also be looking at the case where P is equal to P bar, and then it's just a real polarization, and I'm just looking at sections that are totally covariant constant along the leaves, or integrable leaves of this P, because integrable, because I would like to have the P is integrable. And integrable means that if I take two sections of P and I take their bracket, it should again be a section of P. And the thing is that I make this assumption because if you don't do this, there tends to be almost no solutions to this equation. Example, if you take the P corresponding to an almost complex structure which is not integrable, Typically, there will be no holomorphic sections of the line bundle. There are remedies for this, and uh, there will be another talk. I won't go there right now. There are many ways of getting around this. But for now, I will assume the integrability. So that's this condition here. OK. So there are various options, right? I mean, P could intersect P bar in various different kinds of ways. One way is that it intersects its conjugate completely, then it's a real polarization, as I just said. The other one extreme is that they do like this. They don't intersect at all. They decompose the tangent space into the holomorphic and the anti-holomorphic tangent bundle. And then I'm just looking at holomorphic sections <coughs> of the line bundle. Okay. All right. And so you can see that, for example, if I take the cotangent bundle, this fits the picture very well because I just take P to be all the cotangent directions inside the tangent space of the cotangent bundle, then everything will be covariant constant along the cotangent directions, and therefore yeah, I will just get functions on the base x, and so I get my Hilbert space back that I was doing when I'm doing canonical quantization, right? That's a good sign. So that one is great. What I also want to mention here is that there are certain things, I mean, this is no way guaranteed to always work, okay? For example, if you take a P that is purely real, but in such a way that all its leaves are dense, then in many cases we can prove that this space is zero-dimensional. If you strictly take it, as I said, smooth sections that are covariant constant. But so there's a remedy even in that case. What you should do is you take distributional sections 
luckily for Kähler polarizations, which I'm going to continue talking about, none of these issues arise. And there's elliptic regularity that says that everything is smooth. So don't worry. No fancy functional analysis coming up. Just differential geometry, if I can get this thing to work. Okay, so let's look at what it means if p intersects p bar in zero. Well, in that case, as I just said before, what happens is that this is completely equivalent to an almost complex structure that's compatible with omega. And the construction is simply, you take a compatible, uh, an almost complex structure that's compatible with omega and you take it, it's i eigenspace. So it squares to minus the identity, so it has i and minus i as the eigenvalues, so you take those two eigenspaces, and it turns out that these are of the same dimension, they split the tangent bundle into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic, and so uh, that becomes a p that I want to use. That's the polarization. And integrability of p is equivalent to integrability of i. So it's very nice. And so in the end of the day, what I'm saying is that actually I also have a Riemannian manifold because I can use omega and i in this combination you see right there, and then I get a Riemannian metric. And so this is a Kähler manifold. These kind of P's are equivalent to kilometers. Very nice. Um, so for a kilo manifold, I can define this, the Silbert space to be holomorphic sections of this line bundle, the pre-quantum line bundle. And that's the one I want. And then one possibility would be to do exactly as it says here, look at all the holomorphic sections, which are square integral with respect to the preferred volume form that there is on a symplectic manifold. Okay. So that's the one I'm going to be considering. Now, here are sort of the fundamental big problems in geometric quantization that I heard about ever since I was a student. Namely, how does this here depend on P? Okay, and so I have heard over and over again that the quantization does not depend on P. I mean, does that uh, resonate with everybody here? So, the people who've done geometric quantization, I think, have heard this many times. You know, it should not depend on P. Okay? It really shouldn't depend on P, the quantization, in some sense intrinsic, and then it doesn't depend on P. But, um, but I, I don't believe this anymore in the naive sense at least. In the sense that if you have any two P's, there should be an isomorphism between the Hilbert spaces that intertwines the two operators in such a way that there's no holonomy if I have three and so on. I really don't believe that's the right answer to this question. And that, I think, is because we get our intuition from physics, and as far as I understand, physics is mainly about flat space or affine spaces. There is some path integral ways of quantizing curved phase spaces, but they are hard to do, as far as I can tell, although I'm not an expert in path intervals by any means. But anyway, so another question is, what is the preferred Hilbert space structure I should be using? Is it the one that I just gave you before? Should it be this one, or should it not be that one? Because physics is totally sensitive to what I write right there. You know, if I change my mind about that, I change my mind possibly about which ones are eigenstates. That changes physics completely. You know, I you know, if I tamper with that, they get really upset at DTU. So, no, no, no. I mean, that's important. And then, how do we quantize observables? So, if I go a lot of slides back, and look at this. Look at this guy here, this F hat. Well, we can just use that, right? Mm, no, because although this guy nicely operates on the Hilbert space of functions on all of them, it does not preserve the property of being polarized. It does not preserve this property. And that means it doesn't act on these Hilbert spaces. So there's a problem with that. So you see, geometric quantization is sort of, it's not really a machinery you can crank all the time like algebraic geometry and it just works, right? This one here has all kinds of faults and uh, problems. Okay, yeah, so, so I made enough fuss about that, I think, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think this is a really important uh, question, okay? 
But what I will give you in this talk here, if we get all the way to the end, is that I will give you answers to one, two, and three here in the case of Kähler structures on general symplectic manifolds. Okay? And so that's a way that these three things talk to each other in a very, very nice way. So when I have two polarizations, I, you know, when I change between them by some isomorphisms, the way I quantize operators over here is really conjugated to the way I do it over here, and so on. Okay, okay. All right. And so now there is a little, uh, little uh, trick uh, which will uh, detect whether you're awake now. Uh, namely, I will change 1 over h bar to k. For the rest of the slides, k will be 1 over h bar. And I will skip the little sub h on the line bundle and it will be l to the k. It's a k's tensor power of the fundamental line bundle. Okay. That corresponds to the symplectic form. But the Hilbert space remains the same. It's the holomorphic sections, okay? Okay, good. All right. So now what I want to try to explain to you uh, is how do you try to answer the question about how it depends on the polarization infinitesimally? Because it turns out to be much easier to answer this question infinitesimally than supposed to actually giving you the unitary equivalences. And so the infinitesimal question would mean the following. I now switch from ha having a single complex structure to having a whole family of them. And so a family just means a smooth map from some manifold T, which is the parameter space right now, and it goes to, well, the big vector space that all complex structures live in, right? Just sections of the endomorphism bundle of the tangent bundle. If that's what they are. They are i's, so that they square to minus the identity, right? Okay, but I want it in such a way that if I take any point sigma and t, then n sigma here is Kähler. So it's a family of Kähler manifolds parameterized by t. Okay. So now to break geometry, we say there's a big space and a vibrator map, right? A vibration map down to a base. I formulate it this way here, because that's what I need. Okay, and then of course what I can do is I can look at the holomorphic sections. For every point in T, I get a complex structure, so I can look at holomorphic sections of the line bundle with respect to that. And so that produces some kind of subspaces inside the smooth sections, right? And that space, I will now assume that it is a smooth subbundle of this cross product bundle. This will not always happen. The dimension could even jump, okay, in continuous families. The index never jumps, but the individual dimensions of the core multigroups can jump. And I'm going to assume that this is a smooth bundle. So in particular, of course, the dimensions don't jump. But second of all, I also have a local trivialization of these, so it's really a smooth subbundle. Okay? And now the idea is that what I would really like to do is I would like to find a connection in this bundle HK, and then my isomorphism of the Hilbert spaces will simply be obtained by saying I have two points in the base, I want to know what's the unitary, or what's, yeah, they will be unitary eventually, but what's the linear map from the fiber here to the fiber here? Well, I take a curve in the base, then I do parallel transport, and I get a map from the fiber here to the fiber here. So now I've infinitesimalized the problem, and it's easier to work with that in, the, in the actual unitaries. That's often the case. Okay, so therefore now I'm looking for connections, natural constructions of connections in these bundles. You, uh, sorry, here you want to take M compact or you're doing something more general? I am doing a very general thing. So M is any symplectic manifold at the moment. Okay. And so you want to consider this as a possibly infinite rank subbundle? It could be like that and so on, and there could be complications of this nature and so on. Mm -hmm. However, they're all inside a trivial bundle. And I have assumed that actually it results in a smooth subbundle. Sure. So if n is compact, this will be a finite rank vector bundle. And if you like to think more about that than the other setting, just make that assumption. The problem is equally hard in that case. All right. So now there's some very elementary things you can say. Namely, if you have a Hermitian structure already in the bundle, HK, 
So you settle what inner product you want to do. For example, my L2 inner product could be one. Then, you know, this parallel transport will be unitary if and only if this connection satisfies this uh, condition of being a Hermitian connection. This is trivial uh, stuff, uh, general stuff, okay? And, moreover, this connection is... Oh, sorry, these isomorphisms that are obtained by parallel transport, they will be projectively independent of the choice of the homotopy class of the path between the two points, if and only if it, the connection is projectively flat. You could also say flat, and then it's completely independent of the homotopy class. And so that's a general thing, right? A parallel transport is invariant under homotopies if it's flat, and if it's only projectively flat, it's only invariant up to a scalar. Projectively flat means the following, that there is a two-form on T such that the curvature of the connection is this two-form tensor, the identity in the fiber. Okay. Now, if I have an automorphism of the whole system, so I have an automorphism of the pre-quantum line bundle, so some group that acts on that, in a way that it drops down and gives an action on the base that preserves the symplectic form necessarily then, so some symmetry group of the whole thing, and if this map I happens to be also gamma equivariant with respect to some kind of action of gamma on T, well then I can say a few things about the group, the group uh, representation that I obtain. Namely, the connect if I have projective flatness on the two, I will get a projective action of a pi of T, so pi one of T extension of my group that will act on the covariant constant sections. So it will act on you know, and, and, and preserve the connection. So it'll act on the covariant constant sections with respect to the connection. And further, if we have a preserved Hermitian structure, of course, I will get a unitary representation. So this is ways to build unitary representations of groups that are of the form a pi 1 of t central extension of gamma. Okay. All of these I will realize in the case of moduli spaces in a second, you'll see. So it's very nice uh, there. Okay. So. Now what I want to do is I want to start trying to build these connections in a differential geometric way, okay? So I just use the data that I have. So I have this family of complex structures, and what I can do is I can take a vector field in T, and I can differentiate the complex structure. So if I just differentiate a map like this, of course I get a new map like that. But the nice thing about it is that it now satisfies this equation here. So the derivative anti-commutes with i, and that's simply because i squares to minus the identity. So if you differentiate that equation, you will immediately get this equation here. So the derivative is not an arbitrary map, but it is one that anti-commutes with i. And so if you use i to define the holomorphic and the anti-holomorphic tangent space, then because of this anti-commutation with i, it turns out that the derivative can be split tensorial into two types, I call them prime and double prime. And the first one is the one that goes from the uh, anti-holomorphic cotangent bundle to the holomorphic tangent bundle. And the other one is the one that goes from the holomorphic tangent bundle to the anti-holomorphic tangent bundle. So it has these two off-diagonal parts, the derivative. There's nothing along the diagonal because of the commutation with I. Okay, good. And now I can, I'm going to make a further assumption, and that is that T is a complex manifold. So I want to use a little bit more complex geometry in the situation. So assume that parameter, my parameter space has a complex structure. And then I say that this family of complex structure is holomorphic if the following thing happens, namely, down on T, I can take now that I have a complex structure and split its tangent space into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. That gives me that V splits as V plus V prime, uh, sorry, V prime plus V double prime. And I want it exactly in such a way that if I differentiate I with respect to V prime, I get the prime part of the full derivative. And if I differentiate in the anti-holomorphic directions, I get the double prime part. That's a compatibility between the complex structure on T and this family. This is actually equivalent to saying that there is a way to take 
M cross T and induce a complex structure on it, on the total space, in such a way that the natural projection to T is a holomorphic vibration. It's just done differential geometrically here, explicitly. Okay. Good. So, let's see if we can come up with ways to generate connections. And the basic idea that goes back to Hitchin, but actually goes back further to um, yeah, somebody who studied the theta functions before him, Welters. Uh, so the, the following idea is to say, I want, well, first of all, you sort of say the trivial thing. Notice that this trivial cross product, of course, has the trivial connection. And the trivial connection is not going to preserve this subbundle because this subbundle is varying inside the trivial bundle. Because the complex structure is varying, so which sections are holomorphic is varying, right, as I move in T. So therefore, I have to modify the trivial connection with some kind of endomorphism. And you know, any connection is, of course, the trivial connection in such a bundle plus a one form with values in endomorphisms of the fibers. That's a general thing about connections, right? So what I could be looking for is a guy like this. But to look in this generality is kind of a little bit weird when you do differential geometry. And so I will look at something that is a little bit smaller than all the endomorphisms of my holomorphic sections. I will then look at the ones that comes from finite order differential operators to begin with. <coughs> I just want to look at one forms on T with values in endomorphisms such that the endomorphisms are given to me by differential operators acting along M. Okay? So I restrict to those. Yeah? Do you mean that the other endomorphisms are not interesting? No. But I like to do differential geometry. So I just restrict to those. Because that means I can do computations for curvature, blah, blah, you'll see. If I just do arbitrary endomorphisms, right? I mean, there are lots of really weird stuff in Hilbert spaces, right? Do you know an interesting example? Which yeah, there are many, but let's not go there. <laughs> okay. So, because it has to do with that these guys extend to sublet spaces and so on, and if you have operators that don't do that, blah, blah, blah. But these are very physical, <coughs> right? Because, I mean, we formulate all the quantum mechanics in terms of differential operators, still, right? More or less. Okay. So I'm going to look for connections which are of the form. The trivial connection plus a correction term. The correction term will act by differential operators along M. And of course, what I want is that I want that they preserve the subbundle. I would like the connection to be exactly such that it preserves the subbundle of holomorphic sections. And so a very simple little lemma says that. Well, this connection will preserve the subbundle if and only if the following equation is satisfied. So this equation is simply just obtained by taking a first order infinitesimal deformation and just seeing what are the conditions for preservation of holomorphicity. Said in other words, you just write down the equation, nabla 0, 1 of the section is 0 and you differentiate with respect to t. And there's two terms where you differentiate the, the number 0, 1, and where you differentiate the other guy. And now we, the other guy differentiated gives you u on it, because that's covariant constant is. So that's the rationale for this equation here. So any u that satisfies this equation here will induce a connection in this bundle here. Yeah? So you have a nabla of the underlying Hermitian uh, structure? So, I have not specified any Hermitian structure yet in this bundle. But, uh, so, in the previous slide also, when you said there is a V prime and V double prime, yeah. and the differentiation of one has to be the, the other? Um, yeah, I'm trying to be one, one before. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the one before. before. There we go. When you said the differentiation of V is V prime, yes. uh, and so on. So, there the differentiation is. With the connection? Um, no, no. That is only on the eye. This is not differentiating any holomorphic sections. Here I'm just talking about differentiating this map from T to this vector space. And so this is a condition on the complex structure I, the family of complex structures. Nothing to do with holomorphic sections yet. Okay. And so in the 
now in the slide where you were, um, you wrote the one zero and zero one part, and that's all of Nabla hat or uh, uh, lemma Nabla hat. So that's the one zero part of Nabla hat. Uh, no, no, it is all. There, there are no Nablas forgotten. Like I might forget Nabla hat or had several some places, but there are no hats forgotten here. This is all going on along M. Okay, so this is now the Hermitian. This is the, uh, oh, that's what you meant by yes, okay, it's okay, okay. It's a Hermitian yeah. connection in the line yes, bundle. Yes. This guy is indeed the Hermitian connection in the line bundle, and so is this. So this is an equation that goes on on M for every sigma and T. Okay, and it's the basic equation that tells you that you're preserving holomorphicity. Okay, and so just a very simple observation. We'll soon have a break. I started five minutes past, so uh, maybe we'll go to that and release you for coffee. So let us look at the case where V is equal to V double prime. So I'm only looking at anti-holomorphic directions in T. Well, if I look at this equation up here, that would mean that I put in V double prime for V. But V double prime for I is of the wrong type to be connected with a one zero guy. So I have, we have to go back and look at what V double prime was. So it takes a little while for it to wake up. So remember that the V double prime is indeed in that space. Okay? So it has the wrong type. I hope I didn't make a mistake on that. <laughs> but it, I'm saying this that that so this, yeah, exactly. So the one zero part of it cannot be contracted with the T bar that you saw it has, right? So that contraction is zero. And that's why in the whole, in the, in the anti, sorry, this is a little funny, but, but this is the way it's set up. In the anti-holomorphic directions downstairs, the trivial connection is actually already perfect. It does what it should, it satisfies this equation. So in the anti-holomorphic directions, I don't need to turn on u. I can have a zero u and the equation is solved. But in the other direction, I really have to have a u in order to solve this because, of course, this will no longer be zero. That would be tantamount to saying that there's no variation of the complex structure. So I feel the variation of the complex structure in the holomorphic directions in T, not in the anti-holomorphic ones. And that's because the whole thing is set up so that it's a holomorphic family and it has a natural d bar operator to push forward. Okay, okay. So, uh, let's see if that's a good place to stop. Yeah. I think so. You see, one thing that you can do, so I'll say this last time. One thing <coughs> that you can do if it, the endomorphisms are given by differential operators is that you can restrict things to open subsets on M because they are given by local operators. So therefore it makes sense to ask, how is it working if I take a U, which is just an open patch in M, well, if they're given by differential operators, of course, I can restrict everything. And so here I can ask that this connection preserves holomorphicity locally. And I just wrote the same thing, except that now I only look at things that are sections over some open subset in the manifold. And that only makes sense because the U is given by differential operators. Let me just see. I think that's a... Yeah, there are more things now, but I don't want to go further into that. So let, let's have a break here. Uh, before coffee, is there any more questions? So we'll go for coffee break. We start at uh, 35. Let's thank you again. So um, we were really deeply involved in trying to build these connections on these push forward right? So if somebody likes algebraic geometry, you can also say the following word. You have a manifold, complex manifold or algebraic variety, it's fibering over another base, and you have a projection, and all you're doing is taking a holomorphic line bundle and you're pushing it forward. Now we want to understand that the result of this, you know, we're assuming it's a vector bundle, and we want to understand that it has a connection. We're trying to build that differential geometrically explicitly.
Why can't we build it algebraic geometry? Yes, I welcome you to do this. But actually, that is the formalism in which Nigel worked originally. And so, why did I deviate from that? I am, after all, his student. And the reason was that I really wanted to combine the connection with, uh, you know, differential geometric operands. And then when I only had these global things, it was in, in not accessible to me. Okay? So in a sense, he was just building a global operator. His U is a global operator. And, uh, and we were discussing for a while, is it actually local? And I proved it was local, given by differential operators. So, and, and you'll see why a little later that I really want these differential operators because the other objects I want to combine it with are purely differential geometry and do not have an algebraic geometry description. Okay. All right. So, just want to remind you that we got to the point where I said, well, would, would the nice thing about having something given by differential operators is that I can localize everything to a little open neighborhood of M across the base. And I can ask that it preserves holomorphicity there, and that just means that this equation is satisfied for sections that are just holomorphic in this little open neighborhood. So remember, you know, we have this maybe compact variety or complex manifold. It has maybe very limited number of holomorphic sections. But the moment I open up a little neighborhood, there are lots of holomorphic sections of the line one, right? Infinite dimensional space of it. And that, that could be beneficial to do and work with sometimes. Okay. So, just a few very simple lemmas that are kind of nice, I think. So, if you have two connections, so two Napla huts, and they happen to be both given by second order differential operators, and if you just know that the two symbols of them agree, then they agree. Okay, so the second order symbols. All right. Uh, and that's sort of, um, sorry, that, I, I guess I said that wrong, because I said the, the, the lower one without the assumptions. What I, meant to say, sorry, what I meant to say, actually, and what it says there, is that if they both preserve holomorphicity, then it's actually a consequence of the equation they both satisfy locally, that their second order symbols agree. Okay, that's what I should have said. Sorry. And now comes the second part. What about the reverse? And, and you know, here's the sort of proof. It's very simple because it's just omega is invertible, so they both are equal to the derivative of the complex structure modulo omega. So that, that's the reason. But you have to know that it's a local operator to do this. Now the reverse, okay, says the following: that the space of second-order operators, which preserve holomorphicity locally, forms an affine space over T modeled by, at each point, the holomorphic vector fields on M to X sum with the holomorphic functions on M. So those two vector spaces could be huge, right? If M is non-compact, there might be many holomorphic functions, many holomorphic vector fields. But for example, if M is compact, you know, certainly this is only a copy of C. And you might be in a situation where there are no infinitesimal automorphisms. So that means there are no holomorphic vector fields, and in which case you know it's unique, up to a complex scalar, so up to projective equivalence. Okay. So that's what the little corollary says. They agree if, if, those two, if, if no holomorphic vector fields and only constant holomorphic functions, then the two connections will projectively agree if they are only second order. That's a uniqueness theorem that says that there isn't so much to worry about. It's unique, so you should be able to actually write it down if it's unique, right? Okay. All right. Now, there's something uh, I think somebody asked about. Well, what about... Oh, actually, sorry, that nobody asked about this, but I misinterpreted uh, Moat's question in this direction. What about a Hermitian structure? And so, what I can do is I can look at the following kinds of Hermitian structures in these bundles. So I can take uh, an arbitrary function, which is a smooth function from T over to smooth functions on M. So just a smooth function on M parameterized by T. And then I just modify my inner product with this E to that function. That's a new inner product, right? And it turns out, actually, by some theory involving tuplet operators, any, if, it's, if, if HK is finite dimensional, 
and M is compact, then any inner product is of this form. That was a little side remark. But for now, we can just look at these guys. And so I have lots of Hermitian structures that are obtained this way, right? But if I have a holomorphic vector bundle with a Hermitian structure in it, I have the churn connection. The churn connection is the one that says, well, it's a holomorphic vector bundle, so the zero one part of my connection should agree with the de operator, and then it should be Hermitian. And so that's the unique churn connection that's compatible with this inner product. So I could go and say, all that matters to me are inner products. This is very much in line with physics, but how do I decide which H I'm taking? Okay, and for example, if I ask questions like, what is the curvature of the churn connection? Well, that might be hard to compute, you know, in this case here. And in particular, could I choose this HK in such a way the churn connection is projectively flat? I might still be living under this illusion that all of these Hilbert spaces always have to be projectively isomorphic, right? I mean, as far as I understood, this was the prevailing understanding of this when we were students. Don't you agree? <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. And so the other question would be, okay, I have this trend connection. Can I write it in the form that I just had? I went through this, uh, belabored this differential uh, operator point of view. Can I write it like this? So I'm going to try to answer some of these questions. But what I want to do first is I want to do some abstraction theory. You know, could it possibly be that there are projectively flat connections? Well, I mean, there's some clear obstructions to this, right? And let me go through that. And now I switch to sort of more complex geometry, global complex geometry. Take N and T to be complex manifolds, and let's assume that I have a holomorphic vibration, just as I've been discussing a little bit. All right, let's say that uh, N, let's say, uh, M, yeah, let's say the base is M-dimensional and the fibers are R-dimensional. Okay. Let's say that I have a holomorphic line bundle on N in such a way that all the higher cohomology groups of the fibers are zero. And by the way, everything here, so N is, the, the map pi is proper. I want the fibers to be compact now. Okay. But there are no higher cohomology groups of the line bundle along the fibers. Well, the corollary of this situation here is that then eight zeros will form bundles. Okay. And now, if I look at the leafwise tangent bundle, which I call t, uh, t, t pi, then the Grodin degree Rock theorem says that I can compute the churn character of the push forward bundle. So if you ever go in through the door at the, at the institute in, uh, in Bonn, right, that's the first thing you see. That the churn character of this bundle is the push forward of the cup of the churn character of the line bundle and the tut class of the leafwise tangent bundle. Okay. That's the Grodin degree or not theorem in for families. Now let's uh, look at this. So I'm going to you know, take the top class of the leafwise tangent bundle and I just break it into the cohomological degrees. So it'll have degrees L and up to R plus M because that's the total space of, of, of N. And now the, the, the Grodin degree, and, and then I see C is going to be C1 of the line bundle. And so the Grodendieck-Riemann-Rock formula reads that the churn character is given by this expression here. So, you know, the 1 over L uh, factorial comes from exponential of the first churn class for the line bundle. That's the churn character of the line bundle. <laughs> I see right there, I move the sum outside. And then I have <laughs> the uh, class of the, of the tangent bundle in such a way that they pair exactly to the fiber dimension and then I push them down, and they live in these degrees here. So I get cohomology classes that live in all degrees of the base. That's in principle. Okay, and now let's assume that this bundle has a flat connection. So by churn bay theory, its churn character will simply be the rank times the exponential of this first churn class that it will have. So that's all it has if it has a projectively flat unitary connection, right? That will mean that I have to satisfy the following relations. So this thing here is simply the rank of the bundle, and this thing here just comes from this first churn class part. 
And that has to be equal to all of this on that side. So it gives huge constraints on the churn classes, right? To have this. So, okay, let's try to look at an example. Let's take the universal curve over moduli space. So I take uh, that, as I just said. If you now take the leafwise cotangent bundle and take k tensor powers of that, then h1 <coughs> is all zero of those. There's only h0 in this case here. And so in that case here, what happens is that when you spell out this entire formula here, you get that the churn character of the push forward is this combination of the kappa classes. So now you go back and say, okay, let's combine this with all of those relations. This would give tons of universal relations on the kappa classes. We know that there are none for the lower sum amount relative to the genus, right? Impossible. In other words, that push forward here cannot have any kind of projectively flat connection. It's simply not possible. So don't look for flat connections there, or projectively flat connections. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to describe some positive results in this theory, because there are plenty of cases where you can get projectively flat connections. And so they are all come, uh, coming from the moduli spaces examples. So I will first describe for you Hitchens' original construction. I will discuss a slight generalization of this to what I call rigid families. This doesn't mean the complex structure is rigid. It means the family is rigid. Okay, then I will talk about metaplectic correction and remove the rigid, sorry, but still for rigid families. And then I think I actually won't talk about four, but I'll go straight to five. So the general case where I remove the rigidity condition completely. <coughs> Because the rigidity condition, that's what I get to in a second, is, is the toughest one. Okay. All right. So, yeah? So you asked us to stay awake in the first one when you said that h bar is the inverse of k. Yeah. And so some of your formulas, k seems to really be a positive integer. It is. But then in some other formulas, it seems to admit. In the beginning, it was not an integer, a 1 over an integer. But now when I took a lot of moduli spaces and so on, they certainly are. But is there some way, if, at the, if you construct your flat connections, then to make it um, back into a complex uh, parameter? Or? Uh, that's a different matter that I will talk about in the end. Oh. Yes. Yes? Sorry, the obstruction you mentioned is uh, if and only if, or just some, uh, this obstruction is? Uh... Uh, th that I don't know. It's only half. OK. The obstruction obstructs existence of projectively flat connections, but if they vanish, I don't know if they can be there is one. There was also this work of Axelrod, de la Peta, and Witten on projectively. Yeah. Where, where I does that fit? It's oh. this case here. It's this case here. I'll refer to that one second. So, so let me just tell you, what is this rigidity condition? <clears throat> so the rigidity condition says the following. I can define a symmetric two tensor on M, simply by taking, using omega to turn the derivative of the complex structure into a symmetric two tensor. <coughs> so the symmetric two tensor I contract with omega, that turns one of the factors of T into T bar star. And that's exactly the kind of object the guy on the left or the right is. So I can define a symmetric smooth two tensor from the derivative of the complex structure, and the family is rigid if that guy is holomorphic. So if that G is holomorphic, I say the family is rigid. It doesn't mean the complex structure is rigid, but it means that I think of the family of complex structures I'm looking at, so the T, that that is rigid. Because it turns out that this is a huge constraint on all possible families of T to be rigid. It really is a rigid family. But so, uh, so then, what the, in this sort of formulation this way, uh, if you look at M to be compact, you assume that G is holomorphic. Furthermore, you assume that there exists a rational number, lambda, that is a proportionality between the cohomology class of the symplectic form and the first churn class. So remember that uh, <coughs> as churn classes, right? <coughs> it only depends on the symplectic form. 
And second of all, H01 of M is zero. Under those three conditions, there exists the Hitchin connection in HK. So all of these guys with hats on, they're all called Hitchin. There exists the Hitchin connection, so one that solves this equation here. So it locally preserves holomorphicity. Moreover, if there are no holomorphic vector fields, then this guy is automatically projectively flat and projectively unique. With U is at most given by second order operators. So that's the sort of, it wasn't exactly the theorem, it's a general, slight generalization of Niger's formulation of this that I did in this differential geometric language. He did it applied to the following situation. Uh, yeah, okay. Sorry, just before we get to the situation, he applied it in. Here is the formula for U. It is an explicit second order differential operator that you can write down that solves this equation in this case. And so what are they? So there is a way to build a second order operator given G, and it goes as follows. Differentiate with respect to the <laughs> connection on M, the Hermitian connection on M, in the zero one in the one zero direction, then you get to here, contract with G so you get to there. Now you combine the connection in the line bundle with the Levi-Civita connection on the manifold, and that preserves types on a Kähler manifold, so it goes to T tensor T star, you contract those two, and you're back at sections of L to the K. That's a kind of Laplace operator construction. It's an explicit construction of a second order differential operator whose symbol is G. That's the leading order part. The sub-leading order part is obtained by considering the Ricci potential. So, because these two forms are cohomologous and you're on a compact Kähler manifold, the difference is dd bar exact. That's a general thing about Kähler manifolds. And so, that's the definition of the Ricci potential. It's the real function in such a way that this equation is satisfied. That determines it up to scale. You pick one f, and then take d of that function along m, contract it with g of v, that's a tensor that a vector field, you stick that into the connection, that's a first order operator. And finally, the zero order operator is just multiplied by this derivative of the Ricci potential. Because remember, the Ricci potential depends on where you are in T, so you can differentiate with respect to a vector field in T. That's the connection, explicitly given. It's this second order differential operator. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Right, so I already said the remarks about the Ricci potential. Okay. Um, yeah, there, 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 there's a little snack here. <coughs> if you want to somehow distill absolutely the most out of this theorem as you possibly can, you can reformulate it a little bit. There is a, so you can remove the assumption that M is compact, it turns out. So if you assume M is not compact, but you still have rigidity, you still have this phenotype condition, you still have this condition, and you now say that there must exist the Ricci potential. Then in that non-compact situation, you can do the whole thing again. And so I'm thinking about this because I, of course, want to apply this to the smooth part of the modular space. Okay. Is it clear why the rigidity um, makes those churn, those churn class obstructions vanish? I mean... It's certainly not satisfied in the example that I gave but I don't see a direct link of why, except that I can construct this projective flat connection. And then I can use train the train way through, but, but no more direct. Not anything beyond that. I know. Okay, so now I want to apply this to the moduli space that we saw yesterday. So now you take, now I can go real quickly over this, because now we are expert in these moduli spaces, right? So you take a closed oriented surface of genus G, you take a finite number of points on it, then you take G, which is a simple and simply connected Lie group, and then you take an assignment of conjugacy classes to all of the points on the surface that you mark in P, that's this map C from P to the space of conjugacy classes, and then M, my manifold that I've been working on so far all the time, that's going to be MC, namely the smooth part of the moduli space of flat G connections on the complement in such a way that the holonomy around each puncture lies in that conjugacy class. And so, if there exist irreducible connections, 
then the smooth part is equal to the irreducible part, of, I mean, the modulized space consisting of irreducible connections. But it might have a smooth part that consists of reducible connections in some degenerate situations. I don't want to exclude those. Okay. And then M has the Narashima Natiya Bot Goldman symplectic form. There are three different points of view on the symplectic form. And so uh, that's the one we heard about yesterday. Okay. So it's a symplectic manifold. And this symplectic form can be exactly normalized in such a way that it is integrable. So that means I can find a pre-quantum line bundle. And it turns out that under these assumptions, the first cohomology of M with U1 coefficients is trivial. And so therefore, the pre-quantum line bundle is actually unique. But on top of that, there is actually a, you know, there's a paper by Dan Fried where he explains how to construct a line bundle using the Kuhn Simon's classical function. So you can actually compute an explicitly way to construct this, uh, this pre-quantum line model, in this case, using the Chern Simons function. But in our case, for all what I'm going to say, you can just arbitrarily pick a pre-quantum line model. They're yeah. all unique and <coughs> applies to my question. But, yeah. Sir, but do, do you assume some kind of this scaling form or environment uh, bracket or some, uh, the existence of the bilinear environment bilinear form? Do you assume yes, that? yes, yes, yes. So, so that was fixed. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's just in between those two lines. Okay. So it's a unique up to scale by the assumption on the Lie group, and it's fixed exactly such that omega satisfies that it's a generator of the of this. This is a copy of the integers. This is a copy of the reals. So there is a unique scale of that bilinear form in such a way that this happens, and it's minimal among such. So you, the existence is assumed. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a simple, and simply it's Lie algebra, so it has a killing form, right? And it's Lie algebra. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But the, but, the, but the normalization of that gadget, well, that can be written down explicitly, okay? It has to be a, an integer generator of perfect cohomology in the manifold when you combine it with some class. Blah, blah. A reference, Dan Fried. Okay. Now, T is going to be the Teichmuller space of the surface with punctures. And then I'm going to use the narashiman shishetri theorem. Well, at least in the case when there's no marked points, then it's straight up the narashiman shishetri theorem. There is a generalization of that theorem due to meta shishetri when there are Ps. And that gives you a family of Kähler structures on the smooth part of the moduli space. So now we have all of the ingredients that we need to run the program. Except we need to know that this is a rigid family of complex structures, and we need to know the other conditions. But there is one thing that you might worry about, is that, well, these moduli spaces, by the theorems there, Nehoshima Shishetri and Mita Shishetri, is actually closed algebraic varieties, you know, projective varieties. And so as such, they have a well-defined notion of holomorphic sections over the entire variety of this. There is a way to actually construct this line bundle, the equivalent determinant line bundle, in such a way that it's a global, you know, rank one and vertical sheaf, blah, 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 and algebraic geometry, right? You go, uh, may ask, is this the holomorphic notion of holomorphic sections the same as the holomorphic sections that I'm working with? Because I'm just working with the holomorphic sections over the open part on this non-compact manifold. Potentially, these could be totally different. But it turns out that I'm going to make the following assumption, namely that the singularities of the moduli space has at least two co-dimensions. And if that happens, then it is well known that this moduli space has what's called rational singularities, and then Hartzog's theorem applies and says that all holomorphic sections on the smooth part extends to unique holomorphic sections on the entire variety. And therefore, those two notions are the same. This would not be the case if the co-dimension is one. Then they might have poles along a singular device. Then you can use Higgs bundle techniques, blah, blah, blah. That's not okay. Um, okay. So, therefore, we can apply this theorem here. Uh, okay. And so this theorem here, so, so what is the reason why we can actually apply this theorem that I showed you? Okay. So, why is it true that G of V is holomorphic? 
The reason why G of V is holomorphic is because G of V is actually one, well, there are many G of Vs because I can go through a basis of the tangent vectors on Teichmann space. And those functions on the Higgs bundle moduli space is, is Hitchens integral system. And they are holomorphic. So therefore the Gs are holomorphic. So I'm using Hitchens integral system on the Higgs bundle moduli space to build these operators with. These are the Gs, it turns out. So they're holomorphic in this case. Great, we have a Richard family. Check on that. But, sorry, isn't that a different complex structure? You were talking about flat connections, and now you're talking about Higgs bundle. What, what happened? Yeah, there was a little less start to in Higgs bundles. I just said, what, what is my proof that G in this case here is holomorphic? Mm -hmm. And the argument was that G here is this function on the second symmetric power of T. Yeah. Now, the cotangent bundle of M is an open dense subset of the Higgs bundle moduli space. And so sections of the second symmetric power becomes holomor I mean becomes functions on the Higgs bundle moduli space. And these functions turn out to exactly be Hitchens integral system in this case. So that was the passage and they extend to all of the Higgs bundle moduli space and so on. Okay. The confusion is that we're talking about local systems but the compact group here. And we arrive, we're realizing that as part of modulus groups, the holomorphic bundle, so we can classify them. We can tell the Higgs bundle moduli. Yes. Okay. Uh, B is trivial, it turns out, because uh, H2 is a copy of the real line. Uh, C is not exactly trivial, but again, it follows from co dimension arguments. And then finally, D is a result of Taktachan and Sograph. They actually construct explicitly those rigid potentials, give formally for them in terms of functional determinants. So therefore, we have the whole thing. We also have that there's no holomorphic vector field. That is another application of Nigel's integrable system. And of course, there's no holomorphic functions because these are complex algebraic rights. Uh, Tuck's theorem again. There's no holomorphic functions on the smooth part. I Everything checks, everything is satisfied, so therefore it applies. Okay, and I, and I just want to emphasize that Nigel had a purely algebraic construction, and Axelrod, De La Pretri, and Witten had a Gates theoretical construction of this. They were using things that wasn't quite rigorous by descending things from infinite dimensions to prove that this is a projectively flat connection. But this is a purely finite dimensional take on it, purely differential geometrically, Nothing special about it. The only place that I need some fancy stuff is the Higgs bundles and to prove that G is, is holomorphic. There is actually also a totally pedestrian proof that G is holomorphic. So we can avoid the Higgs bundle moduli space altogether if you want. Okay, good. So you see here, uh, that's the, what I was just saying, sorry. So in, but but in, that requires that there's no marked points, right? So in the no mark points case, that's where Nigel did his work. That's also where Axelrod and Hitchman Witten did their work. And so one gets in this case a mapping class group invariant connection. Okay, because it's unique. So when you transform it by the mapping class group, it gives you the same thing. So this the previous lemmas that I proved really understands that this is a mapping class group invariant construction. Okay. And then the genus two case, those two approaches did not apply. Our approach applies, but it was his old work of Van Gehmen and de Jung uh, that did that. And then there's a little snack here. It turns out that there is this very specific case that this also covers. And that is if you choose as many points on the surface as you like, but you choose very special contingency classes. So you take the Weyl vector for the Lie Le algebra, or for the, you know, the sum of, half the sum of the positive roots, and then you divide that by the dual Coxeter number and you exponentiate that and you take the conjugacy class of that. That is chosen so carefully that the Fano condition is still satisfied. Whoops. So that means that there is still a lambda such that this works. Okay. Because the moment you turn on P's, you no longer have that H2 is a copy of the real line. H2 will have a copy of the real line plus as many punctures as, as you turn on. So therefore, you have to, there are now many things that could go wrong in this kind of proportionality, and in general it does. 
are these the only class you could choose to have this property preserved? As far as I can tell, I can't prove the converse. <laughs> but, but, but actually, maybe I can even do this because I, I know exactly what the churn class is. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have a general formula, it's not my formula, but there is a general formula for what the churn class is. And in order to make it work, you have to just insert those classes. So, I, more or less, yes. All right. And so, for SU2, what does this correspond to? For SU2, it just means that you choose a constant map into the space of contiguity class. So, you labor by the same contiguity class everywhere. And it's the contiguity class of SU2 which is traceless. Right? So, mm -hmm. It's this middle, middle contiguity class of SU2, or consisting of traceless matrices. You know, it's the one that really features in Kovana formality, right? So that guy, then it works, but if you have the, the following conditions, if G is zero, you have to have at least six points. If G is one and two, you have to have two points and no more requirements for, for, for hygiene. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, can I ask a question about references? Uh, I mean, it's not very relevant. But so, like, I think Hitchin in his paper writes at the end of the introduction something like uh, the case with bunch with mark points is requires significant extensions and will be treated elsewhere. Is there yeah. a text of Hitchin, not the other people I know, but like of him, a paper or something where he writes about this? No, no he didn't do that case. In, okay. okay. He, he left it to the Okay. So, but there, you really need new techniques to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, there was this little bit of a trick that you could actually do it in the cases where have these special, special contiguity classes, because then the C1 aligns just with the symplectic form proportionality. But you know what you can do is you can really easily, or not, <laughs> well, yeah, you can remove this condition. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but it requires new technology, and that is what you have to do, but which is well known in geometric quantization, is you have to introduce metaplectic quantization. And that means that you have to have a square root of the canonical bundle. And so now that's a much weaker condition because that just says that the second stephen Whitney class have to vanish. Then there is a square root of the canonical bundle. What you do is you now change to a new bundle. You tensor on the square root of the canonical bundle onto L to the K, and then it turns out you can run the whole program again. You see, now this depends on sigma, so there is no longer a trivial bundle that this is in, right? But there is a very simple way to build a reference connection in this, and that's basically because the canonical bundle sits inside you know, a certain wedge power of the cotangent bundle. And so when you differentiate in a parameter, you can just project back to that part. It's an orthogonal projection. Not an infinite dimensional orthogonal projection, but just a finite dimensional one, and that builds for you this reference connection. So there is actually a reference connection, and so what you can do is you can do exactly the same kind of thing. I look for a one form with values in differential operators to correct the reference connection in such a way that it preserves the subbundle of holomorphic sections of LSA tensor L to the K. All of that, lo and behold, works. And it turns out, so the, you just need A and C. A was the rigidity, so that still hasn't been removed. And C was, I forgot what C was. Remember what C was? Ah, C was this thing. No, no zero one cohomology. That's the same as no H1 MO. <coughs> okay. So if you assume that, and you assume that the second Stephen Whitney class is zero, then it turns out there exists a U, which locally preserves holomorphicity. Uh, and if you have no holomorphic vector fields and only have constant holomorphic functions, then this guy is projectively unique, given by a second order differential operator. And I fail to write that it's projectively flat. But I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Now, in this case, we cannot write down the, the full connection explicitly. We can only show that it is still the first order, uh, second order part that's unchanged. So it has the same symbol, it has two, right? And then there is some kind of elusive one form on T with values and smooth functions we can't write down. We don't know a formula for this guy, but we can prove abstractly that he exists via, the van via C, the vanishing of this 0, 1 cohomology. So we can write down what the D bar of beta is. 
but not what beats it is itself. There will be little nice projects where you find that. Okay, and so it, it turns out, let's see, what is, so I have to, to half past, right, or sort 35. of, 35, I have to go 35. Okay, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, it, it might be worth uh, looking at this. So, so we, we have some, some rather general stuff, uh, 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 William and I, William is one of my, uh, my former PhD students, and so you can look at the following cohomological map. Look at holomorphic sections of the symmetric else power of the tangent bundle. And then it goes to the first cohomology on M with one lower degree in tensor power. And what it does is it basically just contracts with the symplectic form and with the first churn class. So it's an operation cohomology. And it just does this very particular combination of the, co of the symplectic form and the first churn class. And so the statement we have in complete generality, not using moduli spaces, because the moduli space is always satisfied, but in complete generality, if there is a symplectic manifold that satisfies A and C, and has no uh, second Stephen Whitney class, and there are no tangent vector fields, and no uh, holomorphic functions except for the constant ones, and if we know that this map here is injective for L equals 2 and 3, then the connection must be projectively flat and it must be projectively unique. Okay, so let me just say that in the Higgs bundle case there is a very nifty proof of projectively flatness and that's because I told you before that the second order symbols of these operators are Hitchens integrable system, right? So if you take two different vector fields and on Teichmuller space, you just get two functions on the Higgs bundle moduli space, they correspond to the symbols and now, if you take commutators of operators on the level of symbols, that corresponds to taking Poisson brackets of the symbols. But that Poisson bracket is zero because it's an integrable system. And so that already shows that the commutator of these second order operators is not third order, but second order. And then there's a little trick on the moduli space that shows that there are no second order and no first order operators, there are no holomorphic vector fields. And then the only thing there is is a zero order operator, and that's holomorphic, so it must be constant. So that's the proof in the Higgs bundle case and the modular space case that you're projecting the flatness. But that, it, you don't need this, you don't, that's not available for a general symplectic manifold, but here is the replacement of what we need. And that uh, gives you projection of flatness again as well. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> so now, uh, yeah, there's 20 minutes, okay. Yeah, let's just, so now let, let's look at the second application. So, so in order to do the second application, what I have to do is introduce for you exactly the moduli spaces that are relevant for conformal field theory. That means I have to tell you precisely which conjugacy classes you are allowed to label by. So here we go. Consider the positive wild chamber for our Lie algebra. Consider the usual inner product normalized in such a way that the norm of the longest root is 2. So there's the normalization. Now look at all the lambdas in the positive file chamber whose inner product with the longest root is at most k. Okay. And, of course, you only, you only look at integrable weights. Okay? So this is also part of this. So this is a finite set. This is the finite label set from conformal field theory. All right. And now if you look at the vial vector, it turns out that the vial vector relates the, the level k things and the level k plus h things by addition. So if you just take an element from this set here and you add rho to it, that gives you an isomorphism between this set and then the set where you have k plus h but the inequality is strict, and you don't allow anything on the walls. Okay. So that's a well-known thing. And now I want to give you the conjugacy classes that corresponds to these labels. And what you do is you just take the dual of these elements, which are in the dual of the Lie algebra, right? So you take the dual under the unit product, you divide by k, and you exponentiate it. And you take the conjugacy class of that. Those are the conjugacy classes that correspond to the conformal field theory labels. 
So in other words, if you, for those of you who are familiar with the language from conformal field theory, you look at the space of conformal blocks of a surface with a set of weights on the mark points, that is the same as holomorphic sections over the moduli space L to the K, where the moduli space has exactly those conjugacy class labels. That's a theorem of Pouli, generalization of his supervisor, uh, Bouville, for the closed case. All right. Now, so we look at this moduli space here, and then uh, I have a paper together with some former postdocs and, and former PhD student and a current PhD student that we have generalized it, namely that the, you know, the classical churn simons line bundle construction applies in this punctured case, and you get a pre-consum line bundle on these moduli spaces, in this case. And so, therefore, we are, of course, interested in eight zeros of those. And they form holomorphic bundles over the corresponding type force spaces. Okay, so... Then there is uh, yeah, so quite some work. Basically, you see that what happens now is that these moduli spaces do not satisfy B. So what we have to do is we have to apply metaplectic correction to them. But I just told you exactly which line bundle I want because that's the thing that connects to conformal field theory. So therefore, the exact line bundle that I want should better be of the form the square root of the canonical bundle tends to some other pre-quantum line bundle. And a miracle happens that that always works. It's kind of really crazy, but you have to do a little trick. But I don't have time to actually explain this trick fully, but it has to do with going you know, on a vibration of, an, of some moduli space. But the nice thing about it is that you can actually prove the following theorem that for SUN, and under these normal co-dimension arguments for the singular loci, what happens is that the one that I just defined is isomorphic to another guy over a slightly different moduli space, but what I ha where I have a square root of the canonical bundle. And so now I am in the metaplectic corrected setting. And so now I can apply the construction that I just told you about in the metaplectic correct case to these moduli spaces. So there is this little snack, okay? Because if you look at those moduli spaces here on the nodes, the previous ones, sorry, they may, may actually not always have vanishing second Stiefel Whitney class. But there's a way to sort of fiber a certain moduli space over these, where you added one more point and the trivial label and so on, and then that guy actually has a square root of the canonical bundle, and up on that guy, everything works, and you can get this, uh, uh, you know, square root of canonical bundle to function, and you get what you want there. And so then we can apply the previous constructions to get connections, again, that are you know, projectively flat and projectively unique. Okay, so I, I don't want to go through all of the details of this. But, that, but I'm just saying the metaplectic correct is makes it work. Okay. Now, if, but then, you know, that is just constructing differential geometrically a connection that works for these moduli spaces. What we would like to know is that that actually is the same as the connection that people have constructed from conformal field theory. And so in particular, if I look at genus zero, I would like to explicitly prove that this is the same as the knisnik samoloshev <laughs> connection. So I just spent two minutes going through what's the knisnik samoloshev connection and how do you geometrize that? So the Knistic Samoratikov connection is very simple. So you take lambda 1 up to lambda m in the label set that of allowed labels. Those labels, of course, correspond to classical representations because they are positive weights, you know, integral weights. So I take the corresponding classical representations, I tensor them together, and I take the G invariant part, which is the classical group. <coughs> that is a vector space. And I look at the vector bundle over the configuration space of M points on C with that vector space. And now I just write down an explicit connection like this. So it, and by the way, there is some mistake here. It should have been H there. So it's K plus H. I put in SU2 there. But so there's no need to do SU2 here. Put H there. So it's just a trivial connection. 
plus a specific one form. And this one form acts by algebraic operations. So there's no geometry to begin with. It's just algebraic operations. So those algebraic operations just via the quadratic chasm here acting on the corresponding pair of representations. So a completely explicit differential equation or operator, the KC operator. It's an example. And now I would like to turn this into geometry because I would like to prove that that connection is equivalent to the one I just gave you with metroplectic connection, correction and all of that. And the way that that goes is by geometrizing it. And so what I will use first is but borel way theory. So you take the co-adjoint orbits corresponding to lambda, and then you look at a line bundle that is specified by lambda, and then you look at holomorphic sections over the co-adjoint orbit with respect to sections in L to the or L lambda, that is the vector space of the representation. So this is but borel way theory that realizes representations of sim simple simply connected Lie groups as representation, uh, holomorphic sections over, over co-adjoint orbits. And so therefore, if I now take <coughs> x to be the cross product of the co-adjoint orbits, I take the pullbacks of all the line bundles and I tensor them together on this, then if I look at holomorphic sections over that cross product, I just get the tensor product of the vector spaces. And now if I want the g invariant part, I have to do the thing that we all learned in the old days, that you know, symplectic reduction commutes with quantization. So if I want to take the g invariant part, what I have to do is just take a, a moment map, okay, and then I have to reduce with respect to this moment map, and then h0 of the line bundle induced on that quotient will be the g invariant part. That can also be said in purely algebraic geometric terms. If you take this cross product of orbits and you divide by GIT co quotient construction by GC on that, then that variety has a line bundle and the holomorphic section, so that line bundle is exactly the G invariant sections by definition of the quotient by GIT, right? So therefore, I can describe this vector space here completely explicitly, geometrically, as holomorphic sections over a line bundle over the symplectic reduction. Okay, great. Now, the question is, can I then actually turn all of that into then describing this completely algebraically described connection, this one here, into something that is working with, with differential operators? And so I don't want to go into the details of this, but all I'm saying is that under these constructions, I'm going to take the omega IGs, and I'm going to prove that there is a second order differential operator acting on this space that acts exactly like the omega IGs. And so therefore, I have geometrized the KC connection uh, so that uh, <laughs> in such a way that you know, what we prove is that there exists an explicit differential operator in such a way that the geometrized KC connection is exactly the same as the KC connection on this model space, the symplectic reduction. And now, the last part is simply to understand, uh, let's see, this is, so, so I'm skipping a bit over here, so some details, and so I don't want to go into all the details of this, but the, uh, the, the, sorry, the point is, to sit here, the point is that if you now, then there, so they, then I made the KC connection geometric, and it turns out that a big Sariski open of this geometric space maps directly into the moduli space that I want. In fact, in such a way that the complement is of high co-dimension. And therefore, I get isomorphisms of h zeros. And now I take my geometricized AC connection and I compare it to the connection that we constructed with metroplectic correction. And because of this uniqueness and so on, I just have to check that they both preserve polymorphicity and blah, blah, blah. Then they are the same. And that's the theorem. So we actually get an identification of the Hitchin connection using metroplectic correction and the KC connection. I think a very nice, explicit way of actually doing this. Okay. Just want to add that, uh, well, the KC connection is actually part of a large family of connections which works for all the projectivized bundles of vacua. So if you look at the work of Toshio and Yamada, what they do is they build all of these spaces for all curves with all possible marked 
points with allowed labels, and they <coughs> construct the connection in it, and they prove that in the genus zero case, they get exactly the KC connection. And so their work is a generalization of that. And so uh, one thing that was known quite some time ago by Laszlo was that if you consider no mark points, then it is known that the Hitchin connection is isomorphic to the TUY connection from conformal field theory. So that case was done quite some time ago. And then there is recent work by Biswas and company, Ventworth and Rogelia, and what they do is they prove that these bundles match up with respect to a certain algebraic geometric constructed connection. And what we have done is actually over here is to prove that the differential geometric ones coincide in genus zero. Okay, so I just wanted to review this more general work. And then, okay, okay, so that's, that's showing you how to apply the quantization <coughs> machinery to the different models. <coughs> and if you now wish to say, I want to link it all the way over to Recitique and Tureyev invariants of three manifolds and modular functors and all of that. Then here are the necessary theorems. So what I have done with Kenji Ueno quite some time ago was actually to take the work of TUY and then collect it with a certain fractional power of a line bundle over all the type model spaces of all the surfaces with mark points and then prove that that thing has a flat connection in such a way that you get a central extension of the mapping class group acting on those. And then all of those actually define modular functors. So modular functors is a certain system, a system of actions that the two-dimensional part of the, of the recitigen to ray theory satisfies. And then in order to identify that with the purely combinatorial one that recitigen to ray has defined, what we first did was that we proved that modular functors are determined by the genus zero data. It was a little bit funny because everybody thought that you needed in this basic data, also the genus one part with one function. So if you look at my senior proof, he assumes that you know you also know that part. But what we were able to show in that paper in 2006 was that that genus one part is actually determined by the genus zero part. So if you have an isomorphism at genus zero level, it will automatically extend to all higher genuses. And so the last part was therefore to identify the genus zero modular functor part for these, uh, you know, quantization, with, I, mean, I mean, coming from a conformal field theory with the recitigen to rave combinatorial ones. And that's what we did in 2011. And so that means that now all of this quantization of moduli spaces feeds directly into ability to study the recitigen to rave TQFT. So the one we call the Witten recitigen to rave TQFT today. And so, uh, you see, it is not easy to construct this. It's taken me almost two hours to just rush through the description for you. And so it, it is considerably easier to explain to you the recitigen to ray of construction of this. So then I might ask, why on earth are you doing this? <coughs> well, one answer could be because my advisor was Nigel Hitch. But there is actually a better answer. And that is, you see, it's much like cohomology. So, Cohomology has many different descriptions. The Ram, Hutch, uh, you know, singular cohomology, sheaf cohomology. And they're all different and all good for something. And I think that if you, know, if you want to sort of compare, then the recitigen to ray of constructions is like singular cohomology. So that's nice and easy to define. It doesn't need any differential geometry at all. But what if you want to prove that they, you know, the vanishing theorems that uses the Bockner formula for harmonic forms, if you have positive curvature, how on earth are you going to do that using singular homology? You don't. You use the isomorphism over to cohomology with the Ram, and then over to harmonic forms, and then you use the Bockner formula. And so the, I want to show you an example of this also here. So uh, that's this theorem here, asymptotic faithfulness. And so what you can ask is that, okay, we have now defined representations of the mapping class groups. How good are they? And the answer is they're pretty good, actually, if you look at all the case together. So what we already know, so, for, so remember that in this theory here, for each k, you get a finite dimensional unitary representation of the mapping class group. And we know that that thing has kernel. 
And the reason is that if you take a Dean twist on a surface, then by the axioms a modular tensor, a modular function satisfies, a certain power of this will be the identity. But Dean twists have, of course, infinite order in the mapping class group. So there are lots of things in the kernel for each k. But now the question is, what if I take the intersection over all k? And then the answer is, well, there is only, uh, you see here, if you assume that this, and remember there's this projective ambiguity, I just throw that away completely by saying, I just assume that this unitary representations give you something that's proportional to the identity for all k, then what happens? Well, then it turns out that if you're working with SUN theory where n is bigger than 2, or if you're just working with genus bigger than 2, then that implies the diffio, the element of the mapping class group is the identity. Or if you work with g equals to 2 and SU2, it turns out that you also have the hyperelliptic involution. So that's a very special case, okay? It has to do with every surface of genus 2 is hyperelliptic. And so somehow that symmetry is not <coughs> in all these constructions. But so, you know, how are you going to do this from a combinatorial point of view? You see, if you look at the Resitikin to Ray of T curve T, what they will say is that you write that diffu as the sum of the twists. Then I give you a matrix for how the first Dean twist acts. Then I give you a horrendous matrix to conjugate over to the other Dean twist. Then you act by that, and then you conjugate over to the other, and it's sort of a string, let's say there are 500 Dean twists. How are you ever going to somehow prove that if that's the identity matrix up to scale for all of them, then it's the identity? I don't see you. Okay? You have to invent something new. But it turns out that there is a really sort of a nifty proof in this formalism, which I will spend the last two minutes showing you. Just a question. Yeah? Could you interpret the process saying that you use geometric quantization to prove these results? Can you interpret it as relation? You think we can reach the game to write description? Well, the two are equivalent. So yeah, but do you get? So as you're saying, if you would like to prove it from the other side, you would have to so write on some very yeah. complicated relation. What I can say is that when I had proved this theorem here, I went up to a Microsoft Research Station in uh, whatever it is up in the north of uh, US to talk to these gentlemen for a whole week, trying to explain my proof using turbulence operators to them. And Mike was saying, can you explain this proof in a way that is as sort of unbiased to your approach as possible? And then I was trying to say, you have to uh, somehow establish some kind of property of stretching in some way, blah, 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 blah. And then they actually found a skein theory way of doing this for SU2 only. And the funny thing was that when they came up with the proof first time around, they had this theorem wrong because they were saying the kernel consisted of all hyperelliptic involutions. And then I said, no, 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 that's not right. It's like this. And then after a long time of hard work, they could finally eliminate the higher elliptic involutions of higher genes. So that was missed by the things in the beginning. So the very convoluted thing that kind of related to something to do with, you know, counting lengths of curves using pair of hands, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, you can go in. But I think here it's completely straightforward. It works for all elite groups. I formulated for SUN, but it really is no different from doing this for all simple, simply connected elite groups. And here's the basic tool. The basic tool is turbulence operators. What are turbulence operators? Well, remember that the holomorphic sections are inside this infinite dimensional space of all smooth sections, right? But what I can do is I can orthogonally project onto the holomorphic ones, because these are compact spaces. Let's say I'm working in the case where it's a compact moduli space, then this is much simpler and smooth one. So what I can do now is I can take a smooth function, multiply it onto my holomorphic section, no longer holomorphic, just smooth, orthogonal will project back. Okay? And then uh, there is this beautiful, beautiful theorem here, which I, was, I thought was absolutely amazing when I saw it, due to Bottermann, Meinrenken, and Schlichenmeier. And it says, okay, take any smooth function, take these turbulent operators, take their operator norm, that's a function of k, numbers as function of k, take the limit as k goes to infinity, that limit exists and it's the supremum norm of the function. Beautiful, right? I mean, that means that you, these global 
analytic methods, you can measure the, the, the supremum norm, which is a sharp, sharp thing at a point. And so, in particular, what this says is that if you look at the map that takes functions to the sequence of turbulence operators, then that map is faithful. Okay? But notice, for example, that you know, the endomorphism space is a finite dimensional vector space, but the smooth functions is an infinite dimensional vector space. Of course, each individual K forgets a lot. There's a huge kernel, much similar to what uh, Anton was telling us about for these curves, right? And there's really a clear connection here, which we don't understand yet. Because I could take here a holonomy function, right? Okay, but if you take all k, then of course this here says that it's faithful. Because it's linear, so I take the difference, and if the, the, all the operators agree, well then the supremum norm of the difference will be zero, i.e. Uh, knows the function. Okay, but notice that these turbulence operators, they form smooth sections of the endomorphism bundle. And so what I can do is I can take the Hitchin connection, that was a connection in the bundle HK. Of course, I can introduce the endomorphism connection in the endomorphism bundle. And so now I have the turbulence operators, the sections of the endomorphism bundle, and I have the endomorphism Hitchin connection. And wouldn't it just be great if they play together really well, right? So is it true that the turbulence operators are covariant constant respect to the Hitchin connection? It is not true. And that is a sort of source of why it is not relating very simply to your talk atom. Because there is a huge correction process that's going on from uh, these loop holonomy functions and over to the correct, you know, Resetigin to Rayev curve operators. And, uh, and I'm understanding more and more about this via turbulence operators. But what I can say is that to leading order in K, it's the right thing. So if you take a vector field on T and you differentiate this endomorphism section with respect to the endomorphism connection, you take the operator norm and you take K going to infinity, then that goes to zero. So as in totally as K goes to infinity, it's the right thing. And now you can just use that. Because if you work a little bit with it, what happens is that you can show this way that if you have an element of the mapping class group, and you act on the moduli space, so it acts on functions. And now, if you assume that that phi is in the kernel of all the representations, then you can prove that this difference here in normal goes to zero. And so now you just use linearity, and that shows you that f composed with phi is equal to f for all smooth functions on the moduli space. If you have that property for any diffeomorphism or any homeomorphism, whatever, on a space, of course, you can show that therefore phi must act by the identity on the moduli space. And now it's just a question of which mapping class group elements acts on the identity of the, the SUN moduli space. And so there is a really nice little thing that says, well, the SUN moduli space is inside the character variety for the complexified group. And this guy is a real slice. So if the diffu, the mapping class group element, if that acts by the identity on the real slice, it must act by the identity on an open subset on the character variety, and therefore by algebraicity, it must act by the identity on the entire character variety for the complex group. And Teichmuller space is also inside that. And so you look over at Teichmuller space, and now you ask which elements of the mapping class group acts trivially on Teichmuller space. There is only one guy that does that that's non-trivial. That's the hyperliptic involution in genus 2, because every Riemann surface is hyperliptic in genus 2. That's it. And therefore, you, there you have your argument. That's why it's entirely faithful and it's true. And so, uh, now I, oh, oh there must, I must show you this and then I end. Back to the computer lab. If you take these representations <coughs> of the Martin class group, for genus zero, and you take k to be three, and you take the break group representations that results out of this for any number of strands. Theorem, due to Friedman, Kataev, Larsen, and Wang, this is a theoretical universal quantum computer. So, meaning any Q-bit, Q-gates, 
quantum program you want to run can be implemented as a computation of fuse, 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 so create particles out of the vacuum, right? That's sort of, you know, you start with the empty surface and then you can create pairs of points in this TQFT. Then you break them and then you fuse them back again. That's a measurement. So any kind of measurement you want, any quantum experiment you want to run uh, in qubits, qubits, can be run by some braid here. So if you could realize this TQFT in the real world, you can actually use this to build quantum computers. There is a surface code realization of this TQFT, and it's not exactly this TQFT, but it's a slightly different TQFT that arises from a modular tensor category for finite group that people at Continuum two months ago actually showed, gives, they did a computation of a link invariant for the bromine rings and got minus one, and so that signifies that they have non-abelian anions going on already, because if it would be abelian theory, that thing would have to give one. So it's very close to, to this TQFT, and I think that wouldn't be too much to actually change the surface codes so that this TQFT could be run. So this TQFT is tantamount to studying quantum computations and quantum algorithms. Okay, I finished there by just speeding through what I wanted to have said for curved phase spaces where I actually have solved this problem of how to quantize functions, but as, as you can see what's flying by here, that requires a program of resurgence, but we want to get to that. <laughs> You have a question? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions. So about your last slide about quantum computing. So this was a fifth root of unity, so the third one wouldn't do? No. Uh, is it clear why? Or? Yeah, it has to do with the fact that it, the representation of the mapping class group in that case is factors for a finite group. So I just try to get back to it. So. It turns out that it's, this is the third, first root of unity where you have any chance that it will run dense in the unitaries. And so what it means here to be universal means that the image, the, the technical mathematical theorem that they prove is that the image of the braid group in the corresponding unitary is dense. And so that means that any unitary can be approximated by some braid. So maybe uh, uh, another question, a little bit on, on the relation with different quantization schemes. Like you, you mentioned the representations of the braid group, but what, what, what about like representation of scale in algebras? Do kind of you, you you mentioned that there would be corrections, but how is it? Can you see or do do is there any chance to see scale in algebras yes. represented in those Hilbert spaces? Yeah. I think so. First of all, if you go to the first paper on my reference list, mm -hmm. I did exactly this in the case of U1. Mm -hmm. So there at least you can see the whole program run out and it's of course elementary. We know covariant constant ex section explicit theta functions. Everything can be worked out and it's kind of nice and cute. But it's an abelian theory. It would not be able to give minus one on the bromine rings. It would give one. But so in this case here, you see what happened was that I, I showed you this theorem here. This one here. So what happens is, so what, is what is in the next lower part of this is that, so this is apparently the right thing to first order in 1 over k, because I actually don't just prove this, I prove that this thing is O of 1 over k. And so, and I also know the next step in the correction. You should correct this f by plus 1 over 2k times the Laplace operator on the moduli space times applied to f. If you make that correction, it is O of 1 over k squared. And I know that there is a full asymptotic series that you can produce, given by differential operators that are more and more complicated, acting on the function, in such a way that this happens to infinite order in 1 over k. And now you have to look at, is this series convergent? And it turns out this series is not convergent, it is divergent. And it's sort of maybe expected because this is kind of asymptotic expansion in terms of Feynman diagrams. This is the way you should think. Because the first guy maybe is the loop 
function, and then you have to correct him by many, many, many orders in order to, you know, you have to do the full Feynman diagram expansion. That would correspond to computing, you know, the, the, the not invariant for this guy. And so there is an infinite series that's divergent, but it turns out that it's Chevrolet 1. And you can therefore apply resurgence to it, and via resurgence you can construct operators that are really covariant constant sections and that are isomorphic to the curve operators. And I conjecture that those operators are exactly the ones that you have. Thank you. Uh, I have maybe one last question. So you mentioned this relation between genus 0 and genus 1, that genus 1 is actually yeah. determined by genus 0, which at first sight sounds a little bit surprising. Can you uh, can you say a little bit more conceptually? Why, or do, do you see there's some conceptual reason? What's, uh, yes. well, yes. What is, uh, right, something should, like some stars should align, right? Right. And so the technique that we use is the following. So in these theories there are Dean twists, right? These are operators which are diagonal with respect to factorization along the curve. But here are other kinds of operators. Take two Take uh, insert a vacuum in the surface, split the vacuum into lambda and lambda dagger, move lambda and lambda dagger around, and annihilate them again. This gives an endomorphism, and it turns out that a linear combination of those endomorphisms summing over the labels is, is isomorphic to the Dean twist operator. And now those operators that this is like the Linda operator, right? So something like in spirit, at least in spirit. Yeah, in spirit it's like this because the Velinda formula is derived from this factorization, but these are, you know, what we call curve operators, you know. And so it turns out that there is a sort of linear combination of curve operators that gives the Dane twist. And then those curve operators are compatible with factorizations elsewhere on the surface. And then there is a way to show that those curve operators only depends sort of locally when you factor around the curve. And then you can show that that's all determined by genus zero, and therefore the whole thing is determined by genus zero. Okay. Thank you. So that, that's uh, the idea. <coughs> is there any other question? Yeah. Sir, you mentioned this Yuno Yamada connections. We know. Uh, we know. Uh, sorry. Yes. What, 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 yeah, whether this is also com how the relation to compare with this KZB connection. You mentioned you prove it's KZ connection in the yes. same, yeah. but what about KZB? Or well, I actually don't know what the status of this is. I, I think that it is known, I think, that the uh, you know, bernard knisnik sapolotikov connection in genus 1 is isomorphic to the TUY connection, but I don't actually know the, state, the, the status of that. I see. I, I have the same question to Tashner. I do well now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we link up with the Toshio no Yamada ones. And, uh, oh, they are isomorphism conjecturally yeah. all. Oh, they, I mean, by, the, by this theorem I quoted, they are all already known to be isomorphic to the, uh, at least the, the algebraic teaching con connection construction. But you're right, you're pointing out a place where we don't know it yet. In genus 1, we do not have a separate proof that the uh, TUY connection construction is isomorphic to the, um, uh, the one with metaplectic correction. And that would uh, go via what you are proposing. That w at least that's what I would think of. Geometrize the, the, the BKC connection and then prove something like this. <coughs> but for higher genus, it was already known by uh, Laszlo a long time ago, at least in the non punctured case. Is there any other question? If not, let's thank you again.